Good day, I'm Norman Wabiger. In today's video, we're going to move towards reconsidering natural numbers, which is, of course, a very fundamental part of mathematics, and it's actually how we started this series uh, some years ago. But now, with our investigation of really big numbers and really big arithmetic that goes with those big numbers, we've started to see that maybe there's room for consideration again of what a natural number actually is. So here are some questions that will motivate us. First of all, what exactly is a natural number? Can we say precisely, concretely, logically what a natural number is? Should we distinguish between different types of natural numbers? Maybe there's some reason for separating the different kinds of things that we've been currently grouping together in one big box into separate boxes and looking at things a little bit more finely. And should we distinguish between natural numbers and arithmetical expressions? Arithmetical expressions can evaluate to numbers, but there's some reason to believe that we should treat them as essentially something separate from the numbers that they evaluate to. So, in thinking about these questions, I think it's instructive to keep in mind the words of a very well-known American mathematician, Eret Bishop, lived from 1928 to 1983, who was a pioneer in what is sometimes called constructive mathematics. We're going to be talking about his work, especially when we get to calculus and analysis uh, more. So he a very important thinker in the 20th century. One person who realized that the status quo really needed to be moved in a different direction. But he gave a very lovely prescription here, which uh, I think is well worth studying. He says, meaningful distinctions need to be preserved. Meaningful distinctions need to be preserved. He's talking about a situation where you're looking at something and there's different kinds of objects and there's something fundamentally different about them. And what you don't want to do is just lump them together, ignoring those fundamental differences that are actually there. You want to acknowledge those differences, those distinctions, and build them into your description of what's going on. Very sensible and very actually uh, useful kind of dictum. So far in this course, we have treated natural numbers as belonging to one type, type called nat. And this has included actually quite a few different kinds of objects. So we started out by thinking of a number as a rather primitive listing of marks or strokes on a page, perhaps going back to some kind of Neanderthal arithmetic. And then we moved to Hindu Arabic numbers like 54,107, which of course is very different from this different kind of object really. And then we considered more advanced arithmetical expressions like 10 to the 300 or maybe this expression here or maybe even something a bit more sophisticated with a triangle operation or something even more sophisticated with one of these higher hyper operations or maybe even something like this where the hyper operation now is indexed with this n to the n plus 5, n to the 5th plus 3, something like this humongously huge number uh, which we really have no control over but nevertheless is something that we can write down. So this is a very wide range of possibilities, isn't it? I mean we're starting with something really primitive and moving to something which is pretty sophisticated and really beyond our capabilities of understanding in any really kind of solid meaningful way. And it's natural to think, well, is this just too wide a net? And I think we can acknowledge that casting such a wide net really does lead to problems. So one key problem is that most of our theorems about numbers and their arithmetic start to break down and then fail as we move from small primitive numbers through to Hindu Arabic numbers through to these mega huge mathematical arithmetical expressions for numbers. So, in particular, here's a very important example having to do with primes and the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So, we all know that every natural number can be factored 
as a product of prime numbers in essentially a unique way. That's the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Now, even though that's been around for thousands of years, it goes back to Euclid, it actually is a little bit problematic. In fact, it's a lot problematic once we start getting to bigger numbers. This is a, a curious and disconcerting aspect of the way things are. So prime factorization is actually a technique that only really works for small numbers. And small numbers in quotes here, numbers, you know, that are roughly familiar to us in our usual range of mathematical activities. A billion, a trillion, maybe a trillion, trillion, numbers like this. In this range, prime factorization is no problem. However, if we go significantly beyond that range, into the realms that we've been exploring in our last few videos, then sadly, prime factorization weakens and ultimately breaks down completely. It weakens and then ultimately it breaks down completely. For example, our favorite Z, 10 triangle 10 plus 23, almost surely has no well-defined prime factorization. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic does not actually work with this thing. So if we think of this as a number, then it's no longer true that every number has a prime factorization. This thing doesn't. And I'm going to talk more about this, but just to give you an initial idea. So here is a picture of the number line from 0 or 1 up to Z. There it is up there. And say somewhere down here is 10 triangle 4. And this is not exactly a linear scale, but uh, this is the range that we've seen that's sort of accessible to us in terms of being able to write things down explicitly in our universe even assuming we can employ vast hard drives at Planck scales. Now, perhaps in God's garden, in some different world, where all of these numbers were visible, if we can kind of imagine that for a second, or try to imagine that for a second, it's not entirely clear that that has any meaning, but let's just play this game. So we'll imagine that we have God's garden, and in God's garden we have all of these numbers, and there perhaps this number z does have a prime factorization. And the prime factors will, well, there will be lots of them, typically, and so many of them will be in our range, these ones down here. And we can find some of them. For example, 3 is a prime factor of this thing. Okay, so there will be hundreds, or perhaps thousands, or perhaps trillions of factors that we actually can find. But there will also be lots of factors which are bigger which are beyond 10 triangle 4, but still much smaller than this thing here. Okay, now when we look at this same factorization in our world, okay, in our world, most of these numbers here are lost to us. We cannot write them down because they are too big to fit in our universe, no matter what arithmetical system we pick or choose. In particular, most of these primes that are appearing here in this ideal factorization are not going to be visible to us anymore. They're completely inaccessible. So even though this number, yes, we can write it down, it only takes a little bit of room. The primes involved in factoring it, most of them are going to be completely beyond us. This is very disconcerting, right? But it's a necessary consequence of the realization that the complexity of most of these numbers, less than z, is overwhelming from our point of view. We've seen that, right? That's what we established a few videos ago. We were talking about that. That's a consequence of this. A consequence is that prime factorization of something like Z is completely problematic. It doesn't really exist in a meaningful way. Here's a related important example of something that becomes problematic. This is Euclid's theorem about an unbounded number of primes. So Euclid proved the fact that if you have a finite number of primes, that you can always find another prime which is outside that given collection of primes. Sort of telling us that the primes are unbounded. We can always find another one no matter how many we have. Now this is often taken in modern times to be essentially equivalent to the statement that there are an infinite number of primes. 
Okay, so it is commonly asserted in 20th century mathematics that there are an infinite number of primes. People, this is rubbish. Okay, it's nonsense. It's completely untrue. And the reason it's completely untrue is very simple. It's because there are not an infinite number of anythings. We are not living in an infinite world. There's nothing about our world which is infinite. At least there's no evidence to suggest that there's anything about our world which is infinite in any aspect whatsoever. There are not an infinite number of frogs. There are not an infinite number of electrons. There are not an infinite number of ideas. There are not an infinite number of theorems. There are not an infinite number of people. There are not an infinite number of ghosts. There are not an infinite number of anything, including prime numbers. We can see that when we start to explore these bigger numbers. Right? So if we never go beyond sort of the comfort zone, then we can kind of imagine that this fairy tale idea that we have just keeps on going in some kind of uniform way. But we've seen that that's very far from being the case, that we actually have a completely different experience of numbers and their arithmetic once we start seriously exploring bigger numbers. And what we've seen is that the numbers that we have control of become fewer and fewer and sparser and sparser and they start to thin out and become ever more bizarre. And then ultimately beyond that point there's a point where things drizzle out and stop altogether. And we can't say precisely when that happens or where it happens but happen it will because of the limited nature of the world in which we live in. It's just a consequence of facing the reality that the physicists, the astronomers, the cosmologists are telling us that we inhabit. So in fact, I claim that to be very precise, there are no primes bigger than Z, 10 triangle 10 plus 23. There are no primes bigger than this number. It's not just that there are bigger primes, but we can't find them. No, I assert that it's actually the case that there are no primes bigger than this thing. There are just no numbers that can be expressible in our universe which have the property that they are bigger than this and are also prime. This is a disconcerting statement, of course. And you may say, well, it's just a matter of time before our computers uh, get big enough and we'll be able to explore these regions and find primes. No. Okay? You're not going to find a prime bigger than this. Future viewers, am I right? Maybe viewers from a thousand years from now. I'm willing to bet that you have not found any primes bigger than this number. And probably it's more evident to you that I'm right. There are no big primes of this kind. So, what about Euclid's proof? So, Euclid's proof asserts that no matter how many finite primes you have, you can always find a bigger one. Well, it turns out, and we'll have to have a look at this, that Euclid's proof contains a subtle logical error. It's not a correct proof, in fact. Okay? If we look closely at it, not just kind of quickly look at it, but actually look very carefully at what the proof is telling us and what it's telling us to do, we see that there are some subtle assumptions built in that, upon closer examination, aren't supportable. So the proof is not in fact correct. The proof is correct for smaller numbers. Yes, I'll buy that. But eventually the proof reaches a stage, some bounds where the arguments no longer apply and the proof breaks down and in fact the theorem is no longer a theorem. It's just plainly false. There are no prime numbers bigger than 10 triangle 10 plus 23. But it's not just results that go back to Euclid which are problematic. Many modern so-called theorems in number theory are simply incorrect as currently stated. They are simply not true. And they rely on a false understanding of the nature of the natural numbers. There really is a serious misconception floating around that basically pervades all of modern number theory. Right? So almost all of these fancy modern theorems are in fact limited in extent. They need to be recast in a more limited, careful way. The bounds of possible applicability of these theorems needs to be investigated. Okay? Blanket statements are 
uh, fraught with difficulty. So another serious problem is induction, where we try to prove things by this process of starting with one and then proving things one at a time. So this whole enterprise becomes problematic if we can't actually get to the numbers that we're interested in, say like Z again, by counting from one to Z one step at a time. Clearly if your proof that something is true for Z involves starting with one and then proceeding one step at a time, from one to two, from two to three, from three to four, and then you keep going until you finally get to Z. If that's your proof technique, and then you find out that, in fact, wait a minute, most of the numbers that we encounter between 1 and Z are, in fact, not actually reachable. We can't actually get to them because they're so vast not to fit into the universe. Then that clearly breaks down the logical argument, right? That we no longer have proven our fact for Z. We've proven it only to the extent that we've been able to go from 1 to whatever number we're considering one step at a time. Okay, it's a logical necessity that if you're only going to go one step at a time, you can only make statements about things that you can get to by going one step at a time. So we need to reconsider a lot of things in number theory. We need to think much more carefully and clearly. We need to take into consideration the real dichotomy between small, comfortable, familiar arithmetic and this much more problematic, almost inaccessible arithmetic that we eventually get to when we start to explore far outside our comfort zone. And one way to start to try to make things more precise and to nail things down more clearly is to go back to the very fundamental questions that we started with this video with, which is, you know, what is exactly a natural number? This is sort of at the heart of the matter. What is a natural number? Well, we've met at least three kind of tiers, identifiably different ways of looking at natural numbers. So our first tier is really the one that we started this series with, where we were thinking about natural numbers in a very primitive fashion. Basically as a sequence of strokes or marks on a page. And that's sufficient for us to define an arithmetic involving addition and multiplication in a relatively simple kind of naive way, where we in fact don't actually even need to have names for such things. We could say this is mark, 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 times mark, 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 equals mark, 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 mark. And a little bit of a departure from what I did in that very first video is that now I'm putting these collections of strokes or marks in little boxes because we're familiar with multi-sets. So we're using multi-set kind of idea here. This is a multi-set of marks. Okay, and that sort of makes things a little bit tighter. And of course we can then sort of recast this in terms of our familiar uh, Hindu-Arabic formulation. This is really 7 plus 4 equals 11. This is really 3 times 4 equals 12. But then we can sort of represent this as just being a shorthand for this. So this kind of statement from this point of view is just a replacement or a convenient notation for expressing this more fundamental manifestation of the arithmetic of natural numbers. So with this view, a natural number is really a, well, it's a bunch of strokes or marks on a page, perhaps enclosed in some kind of box or container or multi-set. And then another big step up is to go to the Hindu-Arabic natural number presentation that we're familiar with, that we actually use in everyday life where numbers now are things like 34 or 152. And the arithmetic is done at this level where, that we learn in primary school. 34 plus 152 is 186. 57 times 14 is 798 and so on. And although there's a natural connection between these two things, there's also a natural separation. And there is some senses in which this is a more sophisticated and more wide-ranging uh, approach to numbers than this one. And then another big step is to consider just arithmetical expressions. So for example, we could say, look at this number here, 3 to the 5th minus 14 squared. 
that's an arithmetical expression for a number. And here's another arithmetical expression, 6 factorial. And here's another arithmetical expression, 13 times 59. Okay, so here we're working with some kind of arithmetical expressions, and we can do arithmetic with these arithmetical expressions as evidenced here. But you can see that this is going to be uh, much more challenging to set up because we have to decide, well, what kinds of expressions we're going to allow, what are the rules that we're going to adopt, when are we going to decide when two expressions are equal, and so on. So, Although we could, uh, and perhaps will, talk about this, it might be useful for us to really separate what we currently have. So currently we jumble all these together, and we say, oh, consider this number here, that's 4, and consider this number, it's 798, and consider this number, 13 times 59. We treat them all as more or less just different manifestations of the same thing. But what I'm saying here is that what we've been talking about really leads us to want to separate things into different levels so that there are different kinds of natural numbers. And we might actually introduce different types for what currently is just only one type. So we could say reserve nat to be a primitive natural number of this kind. And we could use num to represent Hindu-Arabic natural number. And we could introduce something like num expression or num exp to denote some kind of arithmetical expression. Although we would have to be more precise about the nature of this kind of object. So this way we would have different levels of natural numbers and not just the single all-embracing container that we currently have. So let's say a little bit about that first type, the primitive natural numbers. So note that we are going to use M sets or multi sets as containers for, for NAT. So that we really are adopting this data structure point of view here. And this is another example of the very useful uh, application of multi sets, that they give us a vehicle for introducing and creating, in fact, the natural numbers. Okay, so this is very different from the set theoretical formulation, as we described a few videos ago, attributing it to John von Neumann. The idea that a natural number is a, a set, uh, a set of sets, and everything is built up from the empty set, in terms of sets of empty sets and other sets and so on, sort of nested inside each other in a rather complicated way. So here the possibility is that uh, we can simplify things dramatically because we can use the, the M set notation. Then we only have these uh, single primitive objects, which we might call a stroke or a mark, which are uh, then going to populate our M sets and going to create our natural numbers for us. So here then is a, a definition, okay? Um, a definition of what a natural number is. Actually, more precisely, what a primitive natural number is, if we want to be a little bit more specific. So a primitive natural number is an M set of marks. This is what we're going to call a mark. An M set of marks is a natural number. And this type, nat, is going to be now our type that represents a primitive natural number. So an M set of marks is specified by writing it down clearly and completely. There's now only one way of really officially writing down a primitive natural number, which is to write it out like this. It's an M set of marks, so you have to make all the marks and you put them in a square bracket box, and that is a natural number. That, more precisely, is a primitive natural number, an element of nat. So note that this is similar, but somewhat different from our very first lecture, MF1. In that lecture, we hadn't talked about data structures. We didn't have the idea of sets or lists or ordered sets or multi-sets. And we didn't put our strings of marks or strokes in a box or container. But now that we are familiar with multi-sets, and we're a little bit comfortable with them, and we recognize that they're flexible um, objects, we are going to do that. So we're going to shift gears just a little bit. We're allowed to do that. And we're going to now regard a natural number as a M-set of marks in the usual M-set notation. 
So M sets, of course, I remind you, um, allow repetition. We definitely need that because there's only one type of thing that's happening in here. And there's no commas because the order doesn't matter. You can interchange the order and it doesn't matter. It doesn't change things. Okay, so this is really a fundamentally new but simple approach to really fundamental object in mathematics, the natural numbers, and how we're going to think about natural numbers. Okay, and it's well worth pondering about the pros and cons of this proposed definition. So let me reiterate that again because it's rather important. So that in Math Foundations 1, we did define a natural number as a string of ones. And we expressed this natural number as 1, 1, 1, 1. So we considered the stroke as being 1. Okay, so here we're departing from that. So our basic object is this stroke or mark, which is not to be identified with the number 1, which is rather this. So the number 1 is the M set consisting of a single mark. Here I've written it again. Okay, so this mark here is not the number 1. The number 1 is now the M set consisting of that single mark. That's the number 1. So this is a departure from what we did before, utilizing our familiarity with M sets. There's some clear advantages in making our natural numbers as multi-sets of these strokes or marks. So in particular, the boundaries are clear. So there's less ambiguity or possible confusion when we have lots of different natural numbers sort of on the same page or on the same line. If we don't have the boundaries, then there's more likelihood that these things will run together, especially if we're wanting to juxtapose them or get them close to each other. So in particular, if we're multiplying uh, M sets, say like this, then it's completely clear uh, what we're doing and we can get rid of the multiplication sign and just juxtapose the two M sets. So that's now possible. But if you didn't have M sets there, then this would be a rather dangerous thing to do because it'd be easy to confuse uh, this one with what we would call seven. And there's another interesting consequence of working with M sets, because we've seen from our experience that in the world of M sets, there is a distinguished M set, which is the empty M set. Okay, so this empty M set, which we denote like this, is both natural and useful. And so if we're going to define a primitive natural number as an M set of marks, then it follows that we should allow the possibility of having an empty M set of marks. And so that means that what we're usually thinking of as zero naturally plays a role here. It naturally arises as a type of natural number, which is of course different from the historical story, and it's also different from what we did in the first part of this series. We have up till now not treated zero as a natural number, but now we see that when we make this shift to this data structure point of view, regard natural numbers as M sets of these more fundamental marks or strokes, then it's natural to allow zero in the picture, and so zero becomes a natural number. So this is a shift that we're making. And I don't apologize for it. I think we, we are open to the possibility of changing our minds. Very important to have this ability and this willingness to change our minds and say, oh, let's do things a little bit differently from the way we thought we were going to do things before. Right? This is mathematics. It's not set in stone. We can proceed, erase something, change things, reconsider, look at things a few years later and say, oh, actually, we should have done this, this, and this. And we need to be prepared to then go back and actually do things the better way. To rub out what we've got and to write in a new and better way. That, of course, applies to a lot of modern mathematics. And, of course, the computer scientists can now rejoice because now zero is part of the natural number system, which computer scientists enjoy because they like starting to count with zero. So this is very exciting. So we've harnessed our understanding of data structures for something very concrete and actually fundamental. Namely, we are pinning arithmetic onto 
the multi-set framework. We are creating natural numbers from a relatively simple kind of ingredient and with this very important data structure kind of thing in mind of a, of a multi-set. In our next video, we want to do something that's uh, even more fundamental. We want to go down right to the bottom or to the core of mathematics. So the natural numbers are pretty close to being at the core of mathematics, but I claim that there is really something underneath the natural numbers that's sort of implicit in what we've been talking about here, but I want to really identify what it is. So that there's a fundamental dichotomy in mathematics, a kind of a yin-yang which hasn't properly been identified. We need to put our fingers very clearly on this and really identify this fundamental dichotomy which is at the core of mathematics and that we are going to use to build up our arithmetic in a, I think, a beautiful way. So, in our next video, it's going to be a rather important one in the sense that we're going to really introduce a almost philosophically um, novel way of thinking about what mathematics ultimately is really about. Once we get right to the bottom, what's the essence of mathematics? We're going to find out next time. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.